Okay, so we're going to get started. This is ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Qt building apps. My name is Lucas Danzinger, and this is Koshek Hajra. We're both engineers on the ArcGIS Runtime SDK team. And today we're going to talk about building cross-platform applications with Qt and the Runtime SDK for Qt. We're first going to go over an intro of what the Qt framework is to hopefully get you some baseline understanding of of what the Qt framework is and what some of the capabilities of it are. Then we'll jump into talking about the ArcGIS Runtime SDK and talk about how we extend the Qt framework with ArcGIS functionality. Um, next we'll talk about app design patterns. So if you're using the Runtime SDK, which app uh, patterns, which APIs you can use, which UI frameworks you can use. And then we'll talk about SDK resources that we bundle with our SDK. Um, we don't just ship a library, we ship a bunch of different useful SDK resources to help you build apps. So just so everybody knows, this is an intro level tech session, so we're not going to dive really deep into Qt. We're not going to dive really deep into ArcGIS runtime specific functionality. We're going to talk about how to get started, how to use the tooling, and those types of things. So what is the Qt framework? Qt Framework is a portable set of libraries that allows you to write your application one time and run it anywhere. And it does this by building as native C++. Um, if you think about building a cross-platform application and some functionality you want to add, for example, let's say you wanted to build an app that used Bluetooth. If you wanted it to run on Android, you would need to hook into the different Android APIs for Bluetooth. And iOS, you'd have to hook into the iOS APIs for Bluetooth. What Qt does is they figure out that plumbing for you and expose one abstracted library that you write your code against. And so this makes it a very approachable API and, and very easy to use. It's also an open, uh, it's an open code base in the sense that you can actually get the source code, build it yourself, make modifications, and actually contribute them back. So why would you want to use Qt? Well, primarily it's because you want to build a native cross-platform application. And in the plenary this morning, you heard about web applications in the beginning, and then later about native applications. So web applications are applications that run within the browser. And those are great because you can run them pretty much anywhere, but they have some limitations. One of the main ones being that you can't really work with offline data very easily. With a native application, you can work offline. You can expect good performance. You can access the device sensors and the hardware and the storage. So for example, you can access the GPS receiver, the accelerometer, um, the compass, the camera, all these types of things that you expect on an app that's installed on your mobile phone, you can do uh, with native apps. With Qt, um, you can write your application once, so you have your code base that's coded one time, and simply build it for the different platforms that you want to target. So for example, you could use Windows, Linux, Android, iOS, all from the same code base. And this is pretty nice because a lot of people want a native app, but they're faced with the challenge of having to potentially write four different apps that do the exact same thing. Because of this, I feel that it helps you focus on your app building and your design, and you don't have to focus on all of the platform nuances and understanding how, in, uh, like the earlier example with Bluetooth, how to use Bluetooth on Android versus iOS. You can instead just focus on building the Bluetooth experience into your app. So why would you want to use the ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Qt? Well, it'd be because you want to take advantage of all the things that I just talked about with Qt, but you want to bring the location component into your application. Now, Qt, like most native frameworks, has location and mapping built into it. Um, but the things that you can do um, while, while they do, uh, they do a lot of the basic things that you need to do, like geocoding and routing, displaying base maps and graphics. But oftentimes people use the runtime SDK because they need to do something that's a little bit more advanced. Like they might need to do analysis, they might need to work completely disconnected, make edits, sync them back to services. They might need to do uh, custom symbology that you've created in ArcGIS Pro. And you might need to support different data formats. So maybe you're working with, maybe you have a customer requirement to use 
WMS or shape files or some other OGC standard. So how do you get started? The first thing you do is you install the Qt framework, which comes from the Qt company. Then you log on to the ArcGIS for Developers website with your developer subscription. Download and run the installer for the ArcGIS runtime SDK for Qt. And once that's complete, you'll run a post installer that helps integrate our SDK with the Qt framework. So now Koshik is going to walk us through uh, the process of installing Qt and the ArcGIS runtime SDK for Qt. Thank you, Lucas, and <clears throat> good evening, everyone. So I hope you guys are absolutely convinced that you need to use Qt. Um, so if you are, then we need to show you where to go to get all your stuff. So the first place you go is to go to the Qt's website, the Qt company's website, <clears throat> create an account there. And once you create an account, log in and sign in there, you go to the download section and download the latest SDK, that's uh, the framework that's out there. Once you're done with that, then head over to the developers.arcgis website and download the SDK for the platform that you want to target, like uh, actually develop on. So for example, I'm on Mac, I'll download the uh, Mac OS SDK. So we want to create an account here as well and then look, go through the install, all the installation directions over here, install everything, and then um, you can start your development. So let's see how the installations look on disk. So for example, in my case, the Qt installation for me, which is 5.10.1 is what I have. It's on my home directory, Qt 5.10.1. And here is my ArcGIS installation. So how does the ArcGIS, uh, as, a, um, as a kid, know about Qt's existence? So that's where a tool called Post Installer comes in play. We ship this tool along with our SDK, and it binds the dev environment so that you know, it can discover all the ArcGIS docs, all the IDE um, uh, templates, and I'm going to show you how that works. So this is the post installer tool. Let me hide this in the background. So <clears throat> once you start it, this is the first screen that you get. Once you click on next, it asks you all the stuff that you want to configure. So what are these? I'm going to explain it to you in a bit. So the first thing I'm going to select is Cube Creator. Basically, it's asking where is the Cube Creator on my disk. Well, I just showed you where my installation directory for Qt was, so I'm going to browse to that. Also, what, what other target platform am I going to use? So let's say I'm going to target Mac OS, and these are called kits. Kit in Qt world is a combination of your compilers, your debuggers. So I'm going to use the Mac OS, I'm going to configure the Mac OS kit. And if I say I want to build for iOS as well, I'll check that as well. And then once I go to next, I'm going to browse where my Qt creator is. I just showed you it was on my home directory under Qt 5.10.1, and that's where the Qt Creator app is. So I'm going to select that. And then once I click on Mac OS, do the same thing. And in this case, I'm going to browse under the Clang 64-bit bin. That's where QMake is. So from QMake, we can kind of deduce where, um, from this path, we can deduce where to put all everything. So once I click on install, it's going to put everything in the right place. Click on done. Now, when I go to Qt Creator, this is my IDE. If I go to file and new file or project, I see that there is a project called ArcGIS, and there are three templates. Why are there three templates, Lucas? Yeah, so we have three different templates because we have a, a variety of app patterns that we support within the SDK. So we'll go through each of these here. Um, the first one is QML with Qt Quick. And so when we ship our SDK, we have two main APIs that we support. We have a QML API and a C++ API. 
We'll talk in a little more detail shortly about what QML is, um, but you should know that if you're a web developer that this is a, a good experience for you because it's a JavaScript based language and we find that the bar of entry is fairly low for, for JavaScript developers to use QML. If you're using QML, you're using the Qt Quick UI framework and this framework is supported um, on Linux, Mac, Windows, iOS, and Android. So all of the platforms that we as the ArcGIS Runtime SDK supports, um, the QML with QQuick pattern will support. The second app pattern you can follow is using C++ with QQuick. So that's where your UI is in QML, but your backend is in C++. So your actual runtime code will be written using C++. If you're a C++ developer, this is a great pattern for you to follow. Um, this is something that we're seeing more and more people pick up on because it scales really well on mobile platforms. So just with this, similar with the QML with QQuick app pattern, it runs on all the different platforms and is supported pretty much anywhere. The last pattern is C++ with Qt Widgets. And Qt Widgets is a uh, desktop UI framework and it's been around for a while and it has quite a lot of functionality. So if you're a C++ developer that only needs to target desktops, then you might want to consider Qt widgets. So if you're using our C++ API, you have access to all of the runtime capabilities. So all of the things that you're seeing in the plenary and the demos out in the showcase, you have access in our C++ API. You can, like I said, create your UI with Qt Quick. So you're writing QML code or you can write it with Qt widgets if you're targeting desktops. One unique thing about C++ versus QML is that you can utilize our local server SDK. Local server is a product that we have that allows you to run essentially a mini ArcGIS server on your device. This is supported on Windows and Linux and you can build map packages and geoprocessing packages in ArcMap and then spin those up as services locally and connect to them. So this is a powerful way to do uh, mapping and analysis offline with Windows and Linux. Um, C++ has the most flexi flexibility if you're working with that API because you can hook into pretty much anything. You can, uh, you can use all the different app design patterns that you want like M MVC. So it really is a good um, option if you have the skill set to use C++. Now with QML you also get access to all the runtime capabilities except for a local server. That's something that we only support with C++. What is QML? It's a declarative language from the Qt company. So on the bottom here, you can see some QML code. The nice thing about it is that it's very readable. Probably anybody in here, even if you have no idea what QML is, can look at this code and figure out what it's doing. In this case, it's a map view with a map inside of it. And then there's a streets vector base map. Then I have a feature layer inside of it pointing to a feature service. So that's one of the really nice things is that it's this declarative JSON CSS like syntax. Along with that, you can write procedural code in JavaScript. So if you, for example, kick off a geocoding task and get results back, you can iterate through the results, create graphics, and throw those into the map. With QML, you can rapidly create your UI and use animations and pre-built controls. And like I mentioned, all of the functionality that you have in ArcGIS Runtime is available with QML. I think one thing that's really nice about QML is that it's really fast and fun to write applications. So you can build something really cool really quickly. All right, so now we're gonna jump back to Koshik and he's gonna show us how to use the different templates to create the different uh, types of applications that we support. Cool, thanks Lucas. So we'll start back right where we ended in the last demo. <clears throat> so as Lucas pointed out, there are three app patterns. And the first one he showed was the QML pattern where you write your UI in QML and your backend code in and actually all your procedural code in JavaScript. So I'm gonna choose that pattern. And as you can see here, we say platform, um, the supported platform is platform independent because it supports all platforms. So once I click next, it's just asking me for a name for my app. I just select the default and 
where I want to create it, I again pick the defaults. And once I click on next, it's asking me for some more details, like what kind of base map do you want? Um, there are so many to choose from. Um, I'm just going to go with the default. And it's also asking me if it's going to be a 3D project. Um, I'm just letting it to be as 2D for now. And once I click next, it ask me what are the platforms that I want to target. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to say, I'm going to build for desktop. But because QML supports all platforms, I could target Android or iOS for that matter. So let's select desktop and Clang be the compiler on Mac. Once I click on next, it's asking about version control, which I don't want to do, and I click on finish. And here is all the code that you see. So here is the map view, and within the map view, there is a map with the topographic base map. So once I switch to release, and I build and run this, I have an application with a fully functional map. So you saw that I did not have to write one line of code even. And this is a fully functional map. Now, if I wanted to add some controls, let's say if I want to add a button, I could just create a button type and add some text saying my button. And on the on clicked, I could write some JavaScript code. Let's say I, I can just say console dot log button was clicked. Now if I run it, <clears throat> here's my button. And now if I run this, if I click on this button, I can see in my console that it prints out button was clicked. So I can write all of this code in JavaScript, separate JavaScript files and bring them, as, bring them in as imports. I can write them inline, however I, I choose to write. But this is pure JavaScript code again. So that's one pattern. Let's take a look at the next one. I go to File, New Project again, and I switch this time to the pattern where I use QML as my front end, but my back end code, all the runtime code that I will be using, will be in C++. So again, I choose my defaults. And this time, I'm going to create a 3D project just because it looks cool. And again, choose my defaults and select Clang and finish. So in here, just the view part is, here is a scene view component. All my runtime, the code that you saw, the base map code and all of that, everything is in C++. Let's switch it back to release. And if I build and run, you should see a scene view. All of that code is in C++, the base map and everything. There. I have a fully functional scene view, but I did not have to write any code. So if, if I wanted to add a button, I can again do the same thing here. I can just add a button and write all of that code. But any procedural code that I write, let's say text button and then on click. So all the code that I want to write here, I'll have to write that in C++. Any, any runtime code, I can write JavaScript code to do something, some animations, but any procedural code I have any code that involves runtime, I'll have to write that in C++. For sake of time, I'm not going to do that right now, but let's go to the last pattern, which is cute widgets. And with widgets, it's classic desktop style applications. It's you only create applications that target Mac, Windows, and Linux. So again, I'm going to select all the defaults and just go through them. Now you see my target platform only shows one because there is only one desktop in my case, so which is Mac. <clears throat> Once I select all the defaults, now you see all your code is in C++. Here's your map graphics view. Here's your, you're creating a new map object and then adding the map to the map view. 
and I'm then setting the central widget to that. So if I build and run again, I should get a very functional map. And this is built with purely with C++. Now any view components that I want to add, they'll be with cute widgets, which will look like very classic desktop style controls, like you know, WinForms type controls. All right, so you can see like QML is very easy to write, very little code that you have to write. Um, and in the back end, like all the code that it's calling, it's still C++, so it's still going to be very performant because our runtime core is all like C++ code. So it's just you're building all your UI in QML. So that's something to keep in mind. So the, the widgets pattern and the pattern where your backend code in C++, both of those cases, you're still using only the C++ API, the runtime C++ API. But in QML, you're using QML API. All right, back to you, Lucas. All right, so now I want to talk about using the SDK to build your applications. When I say SDK, I'm, I'm differentiating it from the API, the actual library, the, the features and functionality that we have. We take a lot of time at Esri to build good SDKs so that you as developers have a good experience and lots of different resources to use. So I just want to walk you through the different pieces that we have so you understand how to use them to your advantage. Um, we have an API reference. We have conceptual guide documentation that explains more of concepts than the specifics of the API reference. We have samples. We have toolkit components. We're working on example apps like you've seen in the plenary. Um, and we also have GeoNet, which is a great community uh, area for us to all interact with each other. So the place that you access all of these different things is the developer website. So this is developers.arcgis.com forward slash cute. And you saw this earlier when Koshik was installing the SDK. So this is our landing page, um, and the first thing that I'll take you to is the guide. So we have some installation topics here that'll help you get started. Um, you know, with Koshik's demo, it looked very simple, and it, it's not too bad, but there are more specifics that you need to do, obviously, when you, when you install everything. So, it's not. oh, interesting. Okay, so yeah, I'll jump back to the, the main developer site. So here's developers.arcgis.com forward slash cute, and here is where you access the guide, the conceptual documentation. We have install guides for Windows, Mac, and Linux as your host development machines. Um, if you're working on Windows, you can build apps for Windows or Android. If you're working on Mac, you can build for <laughs> Mac, Android, or iOS. And Linux will support Linux and Android development. So this will tell you how to get your environment set up for all of those uh, different platforms. We also have topics on some of the fundamental things that you need to understand, like what maps and layers are. Um, talks about geometries and how to work with our different tasks, and things like that. And then we jump into more detailed information, like how to use search for identifying and geocoding, how to do editing online and offline, how to perform analysis using tasks and, and our new uh, 3D scene analysis. We also have our API reference here. So if you know you need to work with a specific class, but you want to understand how to use it, you go to the API reference. So for example, Let's say I know I want to work with the mobile map package. We can use the filter that we have here, open that up, and see the different constructors that we have and the different uh, properties, getters and setters and signals and things like that. So our samples aim to take API functionality, common small bits of functionality that people want to do and showcase those in really easy, easily digestible pieces of code. So you can view the different categories we have here, select a sample, for example, view shed, explains what it is, what different classes it uses, and then we have code that shows exactly how to do what the description says. 
If you want to see this running in action, you can go to Download Samples Viewer. And this will download an application that I'll show in a little bit that shows you uh, the, the code running so you can actually see how it works and you can see the code behind it. So that's really useful. And we also have all the samples hosted on GitHub. So if you want to fork and clone the repo and work with that, you can do that. And we have all the samples that you see in the sample viewer are on GitHub. And finally, the community tab will take you to GeoNet, which is basically our forum where we interact with each other. So we try and go on there and help people out. Other people um, contribute as well. We also put blogs and things like that. So this is a good place when you're not at the developer summit, not at the user conference, to get in touch with each other. All right, so now Koshik's going to walk us through using these different SDK resources to build up an app that does a little bit more than, uh, than what I've shown you so far. OK. <clears throat> Thanks, Lucas. So as Lucas mentioned, we have different components to our SDK. So there, is, there are the sample apps, then there is doc, and the website resources. So I'm going to show you quickly how to use the sample app reuse a lot of code from sample app to create an app that um, is for, like basically from start to finish. For the sake of time, um, I have pre-created the app a little bit, um, but with one key piece of functionality that's missing, and I'm going to use the, the sample app to fill that gap in. So let's um, run it really quick and see how it looks at the moment. So it's a very simple routing app, and it does some geocoding in the back end. When, you know, when it comes to location, the first thing that comes to mind is always if you look for geocoding and routing are the two key components of any location-based app. So let's search for a place. Let, you're in Palm Springs, so let's see if we can find Palm Springs. So as you can see, we have a nice suggest list as part of our API. As we start typing, it brings out, it uh, provides suggestions for what you might be searching for. So once I select Palm Springs, it geocodes it, it adds that point on Palm Springs, and then if I search for another place, let's say Redlands, which is where we are based at, and once I select that, it's just hiding behind it, here is Redlands, and I want to, let's say, do a route between Palm Springs and Redlands, and here is my route button, so when I click, well, I'm clicking, but nothing is happening. So that's the piece I, I, I'm going to fill out. So let's see how we can use um, a sample app to, to finish up my routing app. So here is our sample app. And all this code is in QML. But we have a sample app for C++ as well. So let's see if there is a routing app available. So we have these different categories for maps, scenes, layers, and there is a category for routing. So once I select that, there is a find a route sample, and I might be able to use that. So once I click on route, it does provide me, you know, it does the routing for me, and there's a button where I can see all the directions. This is very similar to what I need, so I might be able to reuse a lot of code from this sample, for example. So let's look at the source code. So you know, when you go to click on this menu, it shows the live sample, there is source code, description of what the sample does, and you also have the API reference. So I'm going to look at the source code. And when was the routing done? When I clicked on that route button, right? So I'm going to find the on-click handler for that button, which, as I scroll down, right here is that on-click handler. So I'm going to copy all of that code go back to my app and paste to the on-click handler for my route button. And I like my code aligned, so I'm going to align it. So what is this code doing? So when I click on it, on the route task button, on the route button, it, it checks if my route parameters are null, 
and if they're not null, that only when only then do do the routing. So then it sets some some of the properties on the route parameters. It sets I'm asking for directions. Yes, once you know you're done with the routing, do give me directions, and then it clears out any existing graphics on the route graphics overlay. I have a graphics overlay to draw my uh, route graphic. It's just clearing out any existing graphic that might be there. And clearing out any existing stops that might be there. And creating two new stops and adding them as route parameters. So the stop is the start and the end. And then it's calling solve route, which is an asynchronous task. And where, where is it calling the solve route? On the route task, which means I need a route task. Now what is route task? By the way, we have some gifts here. I'm going to ask some questions. If anybody can answer, you can. I'll maybe throw some at it. No, I'll, you can just come over and get it at the end. So does anybody know about route task from our API? No? That's fine. I'm going to show you in a minute. So let's see how a route task is defined in this sample here. So here's the route task. So in QML, it's just like defined as a route task object. So I'm going to copy that and go to where I would like to paste it. I'd like to paste it right here. I give it an ID. Basically, that's how I interact with that object. <coughs> and then what are other properties that route task has? So now, as you can see, if I hover over it, it says, if you press F1, it sh I get more help, context-sensitive help here. So let, let me press F1. Remember when I ran the post installer, I said, it does put doc as part of the, you know, in, in the IDE. So we get integrated doc here. So I can look at route task. And what are the different properties of route task? I see that, okay, I need a URL. Let's see what a URL is. When I click on it, it says the URL to the REST endpoint of a service or a local path to a mobile geodatabase. So either I can use a local route task or I can use an online one. So in this case, I'm going to use an online route task. I um, have one defined here, so I'm going to use that. And I know that this URL that I have requires credentials. So I'm going to create a credential object. and give it a username and password. Password is route info dot password. All right, so that's, I've defined my route task here. <clears throat> now, This is the loadable resource because it's an online, I'm getting the route task is actually an online route task. So anytime we have online resources, we, we, like, we, want them, we want to load them. So because it's a loadable resource, I want to load the route task. When do I want to load it? Usually I like to load it once, once the map is loaded. So I'm going to call route task dot load here. Now load is an asynchronous task. So it starts the load cycle on a different thread once the map is, map is loaded. And then at some point of time, the load's done and it comes back. So we want to, do so, we want to handle that, like what, what happens once it's loaded. Let's go back to the sample and see what's being done there. So here you see, okay, the route task has a URL and there is an on load status changed signal handler. What, what's being done here? It's saying once it's loaded, create my default parameters. So I want to do the same thing. I'm going to copy that. Go back here to my route task. And paste it. So create default parameters is again like an asynchronous task. So again, that spins off its own thread, comes back at some point of time. And once that's done, I want to do something. Basically, I want to store the resulting route parameters in a global object. So I'm going to copy that as well.
OK. So I'm done setting everything up. Now if I run and click on that route button, does anybody think that it's going to work? Is it going to work? No. Why not? The parameters are actually defined. This, you know, I have a global parameter here. The, it is actually going to work, but you're not going to see anything because route task, the solve is actually an asynchronous task. It goes back and does every, something and comes back. But once it's done, I'm not handling anything for it. So it basically, I need to draw the route graphic, which I'm not done yet. So let's go back to the sample. And sure enough, there is a handler for it. So I'm going to copy that as well. So this is where all the magic happens. Paste it. So once the route task is done, this is where I, it returns a route result. I get the first route from it and store it in a local variable. And then there get the route graphic. I create a route graphic object and set the geometry of it to whatever the geometry the, the route result returned. And now I add the route graphic to the graphics overlay because I have a specific graphics overlay for the graphic. And then I set the directions list model so where I can see all the directions nicely formatted and everything. In the sample, is setting a button to be uh, visibility to be false, but which is not what I want to do. I want to show me the directions menu. Not that. Yes. And now, is it going to work? Probably. If I have every, set up everything correctly. So let's do the same thing. This time I'm going to search for Redlands, California, not. And Palm Springs. So those are my two points, start and end. Now when I click on route, there is my route and all the directions here. So you saw like I really did not write any code. I reused a lot of the code from the sample app. So even for these geocoders, I used a lot of the code from the geocoding sample. We provide like hundreds of samples for you to use. We hope you find them useful and you can use them. We have this, all of this code is hosted on GitHub. Luke is going to show all of that. So also, it's, this is a cross-platform app. So I'm going to try to deploy it on my iOS device here. And then once he's done, I'll probably show it to you how it looks. OK. So Koshik showed you a little bit of the route task. Um, I wanted to jump in and show you a few other cool things that we have in the sample viewer. When it opens, you can first click the little burger menu in the top left, and you'll see several categories of, of uh, functionality. And as you click into those, you'll see samples. So um, one you saw in the plenary, plenary this morning was a very complicated app that showed line of sight. Um, but here we have a very simple demonstration on how to use it. So if you wanted to bring line of sight into your application, you could run this and see that I can click around. This is in Patagonia. And it updates where the cyan is the visible and the magenta, in this case, is the obstructed view. And then like Koshik showed, I can go to the source code and see everything here. Another favorite um, is the view shed. So here I can select view shed. And this time I'm going to the Alps and I'm going to drop a point and this starts a view shed. I can then open some settings and start changing them and see them update on the fly. So here I'm using QML Qt Quick controls and binding the sliders to the heading of the view shed. Another popular feature is our vector tile layer. So here we're displaying this cool mid-century vector tile layer. We have other styles like colored pencil and newspaper. These are just kind of the fun ones that we have, but we also have your standard streets, um, navigation, and so on. 
We also have samples for raster layers. Um, we show you how to take tiles offline if you're working online and then want to take a, a tiled service offline. We have samples for that. We have um, OGC layers like WMTS. We show you how to read mobile map packages, um, how to display your device location. So we really have lots of different samples here. So please check it out and take little pieces that you need and start copying them into your applications and modify them from there. Okay, so now a quick word on licensing. I'm not going to go into great detail about how this all works. Um, we'll have the slides available so you can look at it afterwards. But the basic thing to understand is we have four different licensing models. We have a light, basic, standard, and advanced. Light allows you to view maps and layers um, that are coming from the ArcGIS platform. So if you're creating things like mobile map packages and web maps, you can consume those for free with light. Um, basic includes everything in light, but then it starts allowing you to do things like editing uh, secured services and things like that. Standard brings in uh, additional data types that it works with, like shape files and geo packages and raster layers. And then advanced brings in support for some more advanced uh, local server functionality, like uh, geo processing and feature services. In addition, we have an analysis extension that you can use on top of these. Um, and we also have a street map premium extension if you need to purchase data that has routing and nice vector base maps built into it. Okay, so where do you go from here? The first thing that I'd recommend everybody do if they haven't already is to go to developers at arcgis.com forward slash sign hyphen up and create a developer account because that's how you're going to be able to access any of the technology that you're seeing at the conference this week. The next thing you'll want to do is uh, go to the cute.io website and create a, an account, download the Qt framework. You should be able to just start building apps with Qt even without ArcGIS runtime. So I'd encourage you just, once you install the Qt framework, just try and run some of their different samples and get those up and running. Once you do that, install the runtime SDK and run the post installer, and you should be able to start utilizing our <coughs> templates and then start copying functionality from our sample viewers right into those templates. <coughs> Read the fundamental topics in the guide and then start moving on to the different, more advanced topics. Look at the samples and join the forums, please. So, like I mentioned, this session is an intro session, so we're just trying to get you to understand what the SDK is and how to get started. If you really want to deep dive into how to use uh, the runtime or how, how specific parts of the runtime work, we have lots of different uh, functional sessions that cross the entire uh, runtime APIs. We have an architecture that uses the same design and same common core, and so really any session that we give um, regarding analysis or styling maps or anything specific within runtime is applicable to any of the different languages. So we have uh, building 3D applications tomorrow at 1, ArcGIS runtime styling maps tomorrow at 2.30, ArcGIS runtime analysis tomorrow at 4. Um, we have an introduction to the API and architecture on Thursday. Um, that one explains a little bit more about the architecture of how the entire runtime works. We also have editing your data online and offline on Thursday, and there's a few others as well. We also have a few Qt specific sessions, so if you don't want as much of the specifics in runtime, but you actually want to understand more about Qt or tips and tricks with Qt, we have bring out your Qt side, and that is on Thursday at 9, and we also have ArcGIS plus Qt to power your cross-platform apps on Thursday at 5.30. Um, use the Azure Events app to take our survey and let us know what you liked and what you think we could improve on for next year. And with that, we would like to open it up for any questions that you have. And before we end, as I had promised, here is the same application running on this iOS device. You can see that. Same thing. I can see all the route and everything. So, yep. All right. So, so no we, code changes. He was able to deploy it. You could then you know, push it up to a 
the GitHub repository, pull it onto Windows, build it there without any code changes. So that's, that's really the, uh, the power of Qt. All right. Yes. Uh, use the microphone. Sorry. How do you set up the debugger in Qt Creator is the question. Do you have uh, that set up on your Mac? Can you hear me still? You need to switch the input from the iPhone. Oh, yeah. Maybe if you could debug a few lines, like when you click the button, what happens? Um, I don't have a debug build set up, but I can, let me try. All right. Let me switch it to Mac. <clears throat> so if you go to Q Creator and Preferences and go to Build and Run, this is where you can see like, so this is what I was talking about, the kits. So when you click on kit, and I'm using um, desktop in this case, which is right there. And you can see like it's saying I'm using the GCC compiler. The, it's for C++, I'm using the Clang compiler. And then here is my debugger, the LDB debugger. On that, that's where the debugger is. If you want me to see debugging, let's go back to my... Let me switch it to debug, see if, and put it. Ah, this is QML. It's going to break. Let's see if it does. Is it possible to put breakpoints in the, in the JavaScript yeah. code? Or? Um, it should work in the JavaScript code, but not yeah. in the declarative components of, of your QML, because exactly. that, so you can't control the, the order. When you click Right. Right. Yep. So, so you know, one of these. If I set a breakpoint right there, let's see if that. Because that should get hit right as. Right there, you got. So remember what, when am I creating the default parameters is on when the map is done loading. So as soon as the map is done loaded, it's, it's right in the back end. And it's, it's waiting for, you know, for me to move on. So it's trying to create the route parameters. Now if I break, it'll just keep breaking into the code. Yep. Okay. Um, we have a little more than 10 minutes, so we're happy to answer any, any questions anybody has. Yes? So what are the differences between starting directly from the Qt framework versus uh, App Studio? Like what are the benefits and the differences? Yeah. So the question was, what are the benefits of using um, what we're showing here versus using App Studio? Um, so App Studio is, think of it as a extra tooling built on top of what we have. So we build this location API, and they build off of, on, on top of Qt. And they streamline a lot of the things that you need to do. You know, we showed the install process and the build process and all these different types of things. Those are things that, as an SDK user, you'll have to set up on your own and configure on your own, whereas App Studios built these services to basically create the apps for you and, and really help streamline some of those um, processes. So um, what are advantages of using this versus App Studio? Um, I would say if you, especially if you're using our C++ API, you have uh, more access, you have more uh, custom, you can customize it a little bit more because you can use whatever frameworks you want. Uh, App Studio, they have basically build environments set up in servers for you to utilize. So if you have some custom C++ code that you want to use, 
and you want to build that in the cloud with their cloud make services, um, you won't be able to do that. They have they have some different workflows that we can talk about for how to how to do some of those types of things, but it's really more they try and build the full experience for for you. This is more for if you're a developer that you already have your build processes and your workflows and all these different things that you want to do. Um, this this is where the SDK comes into play. Yeah, also if you want to integrate it, you know, as part of like larger projects and this is one component of your many components, then this is what you'll go with. Right, we have, we have many users that are what we refer to as system integrators. So they have large scale applications that do lots of things already and they want to bring location into their applications. They're not ready to offload their processes that they already have to now use you know, build services and things like that. They already have that stuff set up. They actually just want to bring location in and start um, showing a map with their data and things like that. So I don't know if that answers your question. I think if you're considering using the QML API and you don't have existing uh, app infrastructure and things like that, you should definitely consider using App Studio because it does make your life a lot easier for a lot of the different build related processes. The the big thing Maybe is you can um, pull up the help doc or something. Oh sure. The big thing that local server gives you is the ability to run geoprocessing services in a disconnected environment. So we have some, we have geometry engine, we have some different ways you can perform analysis in runtime on the, on the device locally, but we don't have the full geoprocessing framework that we have in ArcGIS Pro and ArcMap available in runtime. So we expose those through services. Now you can access online geoprocessing services without local server, but let's say you're out in the field and you have no connection and you need to run a geoprocessing service. Um, you can spin that geoprocessing package up as a service and execute it there uh, directly on the device without any network connection. So that's, that's really the big thing that local server gives you. Um, that's a good question. So the question is about geometric network tracing and I assume referring to what we saw earlier with the, the REST uh, interface for it. Is that what you're talking about? Um, just even the old geometry network. Okay, well, yeah. Like geometry network versus the utility network. I mean, sure. Even like a, I don't think you have geometric network tracing yet, do you? Uh, we, sub not, not, we don't have geometric network as an API available in the runtime, but you can use geoprocessing. If the geoprocessing tools, you can create models and Python scripts in ArcMap that utilize the geoprocessing uh, tools that are used for geometric networks, create a geoprocessing package and consume that. So you could do that. But we don't have an API right now to, to do a trace, for example. The utility network is still up in the air. We want to support it, but we're still working on designing how we're going to bring that into to runtime. Um, so the question is, there, is there anything that the Qt runtime SDK cannot do that the other platform specific SDKs can do because of its cross-platform nature? Um, in, general, in general, no, but there are some unique features that some of the different teams have implemented. For example, the iOS SDK, our ArcGIS runtime SDK for iOS, They've built in some interesting features into our, our authentication manager. So when you make a request for a secured service, for example, and you give credentials, we cache those credentials in memory um, so that future requests can utilize the tokens that we have uh, stored. So we support that in Qt, and that's sort of the common design that everybody supports in runtime. But the iOS team has taken that a step further and utilized the keychain so that they can store that in the keychain. 
some of those really niche things like that, um, we don't support at the moment. So. so there are maybe a few things like that here and there. But in general, the, uh, the big ticket feature, like we still support authentication with the credential cache and all of those types of things. Um, yeah. I don't have a, a full list of everything, but I'm sure there's other things here and there that are those really unique things. Um, another example would be like if you wanted to use AirDrop. That's not a runtime feature, but it's a iOS. It's an Apple feature. And so if you want to access that, since it's a really specific feature of, of uh, the iOS kit, you'd have to, that's not exposed directly through Qt. You'd have, you actually have to hook into that with Objective-C and then call it from C++, which is totally doable, but it's not there right out of the box. So some of the features that are common, you know, like Bluetooth and GPS and those types of things that are common are all there, but some of those really unique things are not so much. Okay, so the, the question was if you should use Qt Creator or Visual Studio uh, for your IDE. We recommend Qt Creator. I'm guessing what you saw was the compiler that's required for Windows is the Microsoft Visual uh, C++ compiler. So that is required, but we recommend you use Qt Creator for your IDE. With that said, there are some people that use Visual Studio on Windows for Qt Creator but, or for their Qt development, but we integrate um, with Qt Creator with the help and the templates and all that stuff. So that's what we recommend, but it's not the only way to go about doing it. We use Qt Creator. You could use v VI too if you want. <laughs> yes. So the question is, is there a recommended way of doing it in QML or C++? Um, I would say not specifically, but I, th I think you can, if your skills lend yourself to working with QML, then that's great. But if you can use C++, I think you'll be a little bit more flexible. Um, once you want to start doing a lot of analysis and have a lot of procedural code, if you're writing that all in JavaScript, it's not as much of a recommended pattern. We'd really suggest you offload that and do it in C++. So like, let's say you kick off a geocoding task and you get 1,000 results back. If you start iterating through that in JavaScript code, you might start to see a slight lag in your, in your UI. But if you're doing that in C++, you can spin it off in another thread if it's really intensive. And there's a lot more you can do. So I would say there's, it depends on what you're doing. But you should try and limit the amount of JavaScript code that you have in your application. You should try and make it as declarative as possible and let Qt figure out how to make it most optimal. Yeah. Anything else? OK, well, we'll be at the showcase uh, tomorrow and Thursday. So please come on by and talk to us.